All right, let's start it, this up. Good day to everyone of you. I can see that a few of you are on Facebook and the rest of you are on Zoom here in my right screen. It's great to have you. Special welcome to everybody who's uh, listening, international students or people outside of the Netherlands, but also, of course, our Dutch listeners and viewers. Van harte welkom. My name is Jos Hummelen from both CD and NGIZ, NGIZ, that is Nederlands Genootschap for Internationale Zaken, of, oftewel Dutch Society for International Affairs. We cooperate in this webinar. Um, special welcome to our guest of today, our expert, Matthijs de Blois, who I will be introducing shortly. But first, uh, this webinar will be about Israel and international law. It will be available on demand on YouTube. We have our own uh, channel. It's called CDTV. Make sure you look us up. Um, if you have questions, and you're very welcome to ask questions, critical questions, open questions, not statements, questions, uh, you can put them in the in Zoom, if you're following via Zoom, there's a button Q&A below. And if you're watching via Facebook, you can uh, leave your questions in a comment section. Like I said before, Matthijs de Blois is our expert of today. He's a senior fellow at, at the The Hague Initiative for International Cooperation. It's called THINK, so THINK with a C. Look it up, it's www.thinkwithac.info. He discusses the history of Israel and the right of self-determination of the Jewish people. He also wrote a couple of books. I want to mention two. One of uh, them is with Andrew Tucker, also of Think. Um, the book is called Israel on Trial. The other one I want to mention is a Dutch book. It's called Israel and Staat ter Discussie. Um, I think the, the letter is available via uh, ball.com. Um, we will talk about international law in general, but um, we will talk later about territory and borders, human rights and law of war. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. De Blois. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. And uh, indeed, our topic is international, Israel and international law. And that is, a, I think, an important topic. Israel, the state of Israel faces many challenges uh, in the field of international law. We only uh, have to think about its, uh, the ongoing and long lasting conflict with the Palestinian Arabs about territory, borders, settlements, the position of the Jerusalem and so forth. We can think of the nuclear threat coming from Iran, a state blatantly anti-Semitic with the purpose to erase Israel from the face of the earth and which is developing nuclear power uh, we can think of a procedure now pending before the International Criminal Court in The Hague, where uh, the so-called situation in Palestine has been uh, submitted before the court by the prosecutor. And uh, it is about what happens in the, what, what in the newspaper is called the, the occupied territories, the disputed territories. Judea, Samaria, uh, Gaza, and um, well, we will have to see what will come from this procedure, but it is an international law issue. We can think also of what's happening within the United Nations. Very recently, a new committee was uh, established, a commission of inquiry to investigate also the situation in the, in the, in the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories, including East Jerusalem, and with a very broad mandate. And uh, that is maybe an example of, of the position in general within the UN vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state of Israel. 
we can think of international law issues when it comes to the labeling of products coming from the disputed territories from the settlements. In the Netherlands, that is now an issue, but also in the EU, according to EU law, um, there are problems. And we can think also recently of the accusation made by Amnesty International that Israel is an apartheid state, also referring to the international law. So there are many challenges uh, in the field of international law. I'm not sure whether many of you are law students or lawyers. Uh, I guess many of you are not. So we first will say a few words about what is international law in general. And then we move on to the existence, the position of the state of Israel in the line of international law. After that, we will uh, dwell on the issue of territories and the territorial questions, and then move on to the uh, human rights issues, and finally discuss the laws of war that are relevant for the position of the state of Israel. But first of all, <coughs> a few words about international law in general. Uh, many of us are accustomed to national law. We are all, I guess, citizens subject to international law. Uh, we have, uh, to the legislature, uh, making laws uh, to the judiciary, uh, making binding judicial decisions to the executive, also making uh, binding decisions uh, on our lives. We are accustomed to that. We may have some influence when there are elections, uh, as today in the Netherlands, but um, in general, we are subject to international law, whether we like it or not. We cannot say we do not like this court, so we will not follow its ruling. We cannot say we do not like this, this, this law because uh, it is against our convictions, but we are bound by it. And that is inevitable. So that is the situation in a national state, a kind of uh, vertical structure where we have the government and below the, uh, the state, and then we are citizens, we are bound by it. It is a um, kind of vertical structure. In the international law, world it is is different in in the in international law has a kind of horizontal structure the international uh, um, community is composed of about 195 independent sovereign states in principle they decide whether or not they will be bound by law uh, whether they will follow uh, up decisions made by international courts uh, law is made by states, they uh, conclude treaties, that is kind of agreements with other states, sometimes with international organizations. Uh, they decide also on the enforcement of international law in principle, and they are not bound by international courts unless they are have, have uh, said that they will be bound, they have accepted the jurisdiction and, uh, of this court. So uh, it is much. It is a horizontal structure. Of course, that is not the complete picture. We have international organizations, sometimes with uh, mechanisms and, uh, and institutions to enforce the international law, like the Security Council of the of the United Nations, or uh, in the European Union. Of course, the, there are many. Uh, well, there are bodies like the Commission that can enforce the law. Uh, and also uh, there are international courts, uh, the International Court of Justice in The Hague and um, the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg or the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And but in principle, states are only bound by these courts when they have accepted their jurisdiction. So that is different as compared to the national state. Then, uh, who are the subjects of international law? Who have, what are the entities that have rights and duties under international law? Well, first and for all, the states. The states are subject of international law. And what is a state? Well, in international law, there's a very clear definition. It is an entity that has a territory with a population and an effective governing government that uh, has the power in that, on that territory. The size is not important. 
Russia, the Federal Russian Federation is, is a state, but also San Marino or uh, Monaco in uh, France, in the south of France. So that are states. And next to that, we have as subjects of international law, international organizations like the United Nations, like the European Union and many others, NATO. Uh, the United Nations is important also for the discussion on Israel. We have in the United Nations, the, uh, the, the main body is the General Assembly composed of, of uh, representatives of all member states. Uh, we have the Security Council composed of 15 member states, including the five permanent members. Uh, we have the Secretary General and also the International Court of Justice is a is an organ, is an institution of the United Nations. And some other bodies also like the United Nations Human Rights Council, for example, that is a subsidiary body of the uh, General Assembly. Also, so that, these are the international organizations. Next to that, we have individuals as subject of international law. Indeed, in international law, there are some duties that binds us as individuals in the field of, for example, humanitarian law, the laws of war. Uh, war crimes can be prosecuted for international tribunals. In the past already in Nuremberg and now uh, these days in the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, where individuals can be prosecuted because of, of genocide, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, and, and, and crimes of aggression. Um, but individuals do also have rights under international law. Think of the whole body of international human rights law. Many treaties about uh, international, about human rights in, within the framework of the United Nations or sometimes within other frameworks like the Council of Europe. So that, and that about individuals as subject of international law and also peoples are uh, subject of international law. Peoples have a right to self-determination under international law. And as such, they are a subject of it uh, to be distinguished from states and peoples are not automatically becoming a, uh, or creating a state. So that about the subjects. And then the next question is, where do we find international law? Uh, what are the sources of international law? So the first source is the treaties or sometimes called conventions. In principle, international, that are international agreements like contracts we make as citizens among each other. States can conclude treaties with each other. Many, many thousands of treaties have been concluded. Sometimes uh, think of the Charter of the United Nations, which is a worldwide treaty, but we also can have uh, treaties with our neighboring countries about the, the borders, like between the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, about the border uh, of, in, in the, the river, the Skeld River, and uh, so on. Um, Next to that, we have next to treaty law, we have customary law. Customs, practices by states can become law if they are accepted as such, if there is an opinion that we are bound by it. In international law, customary law is, is important. Um, then we have next to that general principles of law, principles that are uh, sometimes also relevant for national legal systems. Uh, like the principle of good faith or the principle that you have to of restitution of in case of unjust enrichment and, and some other principles are important in international law. And next to that, we have sometimes binding decisions of international organizations. In certain situations, for example, the uh, Security Council of the UN can make binding decisions uh, in very in exceptional situations. Mind you, not all resolutions made by the Security Council are binding, not at all. Uh, and the General Assembly also adopts many resolutions. They are not binding law. They are just expressions of an opinion. Um, next to that, we have subsidiary sources of international law like judicial decisions. So the case law of the International Court of Justice, for example, and also in international law, the doctrine of very famous writers like Hugo Grotius or uh, 
Pufendorf uh, may play a role as a source of law. May I ask a question in the mm -hmm. meantime, while you're having yes. your, uh, your water? Yes. Are there colleagues of yours, uh, Mr. de Blois, who disagree with you and say the UN resolutions of the Security Council or the General Assembly are in fact international law? Well, there is a debate going on that, but I think according to the charter, in, in my view, it is rather clear that only resolutions adopted under, and it sounds a bit technical, the chapter seven of the United Nations Charter are binding. That is a resolution in case of a threat of, uh, of, 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 of war. And uh, um, they are, uh, they're, they are binding, but it is very clear from the charter, in my view, that uh, General Assembly resolutions and other Security Council resolutions are not binding, but they can contribute sometimes to the development of international customary law. That is, that's another thing. But as such, they are not binding. And you come across many, many writings, of course, also in more in newspapers, etc that assume that they are binding. And there is some debate, some people say it is soft law. So it is kind of law. But I think if we look at the charter and I think that is the, the most important thing in this respect, the states have accepted powers of the Security, Security Council and the General Assembly uh, when they adopted the United Nations Charter. And it was very explicitly explicit that General Assembly resolutions, for example, would not be binding. Uh, so, maybe but, uh, hmm? I yes. got a good example. I think maybe you can elaborate on it later. Uh, but one of our uh, students already made up his mind yes. and he's saying uh, Israel is an apartheid state. <laughs> what is your yes. answer to that? Well, we come to that. Uh, I can confirm okay. it. I can uh, answer it here, try to answer it here. But I think it's better to discuss that in the framework of our human rights uh, discussion. I think uh, I have it on my paper. So I, I will come back to that because it is a very topical uh, uh, issue, of course. Great. OK. The final remark about international law in general is that it is closely related to politics and intertwined with politics. And an example is, uh, in my view, what happened in 2004. The International Court of Justice adopted an advisory opinion on the security barrier in Israel and or in the disputed territories. Um, that was an advisory opinion. The International Court of Justice has two powers. They may decide in, in conflicts and um, they can then give a binding judgment, but they also can give advisory opinions at the request of United Nations, uh, organs of the United Nations. And these advisory opinions are, as the word says, advisory, they're not binding. But what happened in 2003, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted a resolution to ask the International Court of Justice about the uh, security barrier in created by Israel in uh, after the second Intifada in 2000 and, and further uh, to protect its citizens against the uh, uh, suicide attacks. A very effective means to, to do so. But this security barrier was built partly on uh, the eastern side of the so-called Green Line, that is the uh, armistice line, in fact, of 1949, or sometimes called in the papers the, the borders of 1967, after the, the Six Day War. They are just armistice lines, but nevertheless, they are sometimes uh, seen as international borders, which they are not, I have to say. But, um, well, this security barrier was built partly on east of that line, and it was uh, uh, held by the majority of the General Assembly that was against international law, and they asked for an opinion of the International Court of Justice. The Court of Justice then uh, decided to accept this request. They are not 
bound to do that, but the executors accepted and they gave a ruling on that, which said indeed the uh, security border is against international law. They, uh, in, en passant, in passing, they also remarked that the settlements, Jewish settlements are illegal, which was not uh, strictly speaking part of the request, but nevertheless, they said so. And um, why do I mention this? This, this, this advisor opinion played an enormous role in, still plays an enormous role in the debate on Israel and international law. It is, it is, a, it is in my view, it can be criticized for many, many reasons. And, um, but also the court could have refused the request Maybe that was much better because the whole issue was part of the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. It was a highly sensitive matter. And then to, to impose a judicial view on that sensitive political matter is, is not very advisable for coming to a solution. So the uh, court made a decision and it was so, but the initiative for that was purely political. It was the request by the majority of states in the General Assembly that asked for this opinion. So that illustrates the intertwinement between international law and, and uh, politics, in my view. Okay, this so far so good about international law in general. Um, now we come to the state of Israel in the light of, of, of international law and how it was created. Well, my starting point is 1897. 1897, I guess in this series, you have already heard about Zionism and, and its history. 1897, the first uh, world, uh, uh, first Zionist Congress in Basel, in, in Switzerland. And um, there they adopted uh, the so-called Basel program, program and, and they, formulated there as the aim of Zionism is to create for the Jewish people a home in Palestine secured by public law. These are the words. So Jewish, a home for the Jewish people in Palestine secured by public law. And that was the, the, the uh, aspiration of the World Zionist uh, Organization. And they were looking for support uh, among the uh, great powers of those days, like Russia, like uh, Italy, and like the Pope, France, but also the British government. And there they were, in a sense, successful, because the British government uh, accepted, uh, expressed its opinion in the Balfour Declaration, and maybe you have heard of it, the Balfour Declaration, where it was said that His Majesty's government uh, views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And uh, understood that nothing will be done which will prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. country. So that was the Balfour Declaration, adopted in the midst of the First World War. At the same time, British troops were fighting in, uh, against uh, the Ottoman Empire, part of the central powers like Germany, Austria, uh, and Hungary, uh, and, uh, and also the Ottoman Empire. And uh, it was adopted uh, the 2nd of November, 1917. And uh, a few weeks later, uh, the British troops entered uh, Jerusalem. And this principle, it was an expression, a unilateral expression by the British government. It was accepted by other countries like France, but um, it also played a role later on in the peace negotiations after the First World War. Uh, they started in Versailles in, in near Paris, but they, when it came to the issue of, uh, uh, and, and within the the, the, the peace treaty of uh, Versailles included the institution or the creation of the League of Nations, kind of predecessor of the United Nations of our days. And within this League of Nations, they created a structure to deal with the former colonies of uh, 
of the powers that lost the war, like Germany, but also uh, about the uh, Ottoman Empire, which was already in decay and which, which also uh, stood on the, the wrong side of the, the war, so to say, we lost the war. And uh, they created for these colonies and, and parts of the Ottoman Empire a mandate system. That was quite a new idea inspired by the American president Woodrow Wilson to deal with colonies, not the, the old fashioned idea was to create, to, to, to take the colonies, the, the victors would take the, the, co the colonies of, of, the, of the, the, the parties that lost the war. But no, they created a system to, to lead peoples and territories to independence under the guidance of, of one of the powers, one of another state. And that was the mandate system. And also for uh, the Ottoman Empire, parts of it. And um, in San Remo in 1920, the, 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 the uh, Supreme Allied uh, powers uh, of those days, like France, uh, Britain, uh, Japan, Italy, and also the US, uh, discussed uh, what had to be done with the uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, like Palestine, a good geographical indication, like Syria, Lebanon, Mesopotamia, etc. Et and they decided to create mandates for these uh, parts of the world. And uh, they decided also to create a mandate for Palestine with the British government as the mandatory. And uh, that resulted in the adoption of the mandate for Palestine on the 24th of July, 1922. And that is a very important document for the creation of the state of Israel, in my view. And uh, what about this mandate? Just a quick question about yes. that, because I'm guessing everybody here knows about the, for example, the Balfour Declaration, the yes. partition plan. Um, but is it justifiable that San Remo is less well known in your view? Uh, well, I'm not sure. sure but in San Remo, I think the, 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 the main decisions were made for the, uh, which led to the creation of the mandate for Palestine. Already the mandate system was known, the, the, the Treaty of Versailles was, was adopted, but then they had to, to elaborate on that and uh, decide on what had to be done with the parts of the Ottoman Empire, like Palestine, like Syria, Lebanon, etc., etc. And um, then they adopted the binding resolution, indeed, the, the, the great powers of those days. And they decided and that had to be implemented within the League of Nations. So formally speaking, the, the mandate for Palestine was adopted by the Council of the League of Nations not only these four uh, uh, powers as the, the, the four, uh, 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 yes, the, the victors of the, of, the, of the First World War. So it was a wider support of the, within the League of Nations and they adopted on the basis of Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, the mandate for Palestine. And the mandate, I think we have to, to say some words about that because I think that is important. Um, the mandate for Palestine was there and quoted the same words as the Balfour Declaration. The main obligation is to be found in, in, in Article 2 of the mandate, which says the mandatory shall be responsible, the mandatory, that's the British government, shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home as laid down in the preamble and the development of self-governing institutions and also for safeguarding civil and religious rights of all the inhabitants of Palestine, irrespective of race and religion. That is in a nutshell, what is the, the, the mandate is about and that is, um, well, similar and the same, in fact, as the Belfort Declaration, but that was then accepted by the, the international community of those days. And this mandate has a unique character. First, looking 
at the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries of the mandate are the, the Jewish people as such, not only the Jews living in those days in Palestine, that was a minority living there, but it was a, the, the, the beneficiaries were the, the Jewish people as such all over the world, so to say. And that makes this mandate unique because the other mandates were related to and uh, benefited the, the, the population living in a specific territory, like in Lebanon, Syria, Mesopotamia, etc. But this has a, uh, and, and that is clear from the mandate because it provides, for example, in Article 6, for the right to immigrate to the land, uh, to settle there, close uh, settlement by Jews on the land, Article 6. It uh, provided for a appropriate Jewish agency to serve as a public body for the purpose of advising and cooperating with the administration. It creates um, the uh, possibility for uh, a nationality law that uh, to facilitate the acquisition of Palestinian citizenship, as it was called then, by Jews to take up their permanent residence in Palestine. So it was clearly clear from the whole text that this was about the Jewish people as such that had a right to immigrate to the land of their forefathers in, uh, in, in the geographical area of Palestine. And it is also unique in another respect when it comes to the powers of the mandatory. Article one of the mandates says that the mandatory has full powers of legislation and administration uh, under the mandate. And that was also different from other mandates. And it was necessary to make it possible for the Jewish people to immigrate and to settle because there was already also in these days, a lot of opposition against it. Um, the mandate talks about the Jewish national home. It does not mention Jewish uh, state. And that is, it, it used to, the, the formula already uh, uh, taken uh, by uh, uh, Herzl in 1897, uh, a, home, a home for the Jewish people, Jewish national home. And that was also in the Belfort Declaration and San Remo and also in the mandate. But it was clear if you look at the history that the intention was that it would eventually emerge into a Jewish state. And that was also the whole idea of the mandate system that was about leading peoples and, and, and uh, territories to independence. But what was the justification of this, of this special character, uh, special uh, nature of this uh, mandate? Well, they are given in the preamble of the mandate. It refers to two things. First, the historical connection of the uh, Jewish people with Palestine. There has been always a connection from biblical times until then, until now, with the, the territory. That was the first thing. And the second was the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. And that refers to the, the uh, well, the, 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 the suffering of the, of the Jewish people within the Western world throughout about 2000 years of persecution, of threats of annihilation, of in the 19th century, the pogroms uh, in Russia, in Romania, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that is one of the reasons to create a safe haven, uh, a place for a Jewish national home in the land of uh, Palestine. It has been defended by Balfour, but I, I think that takes too long to, to elaborate on that, but that was the, the these are the reasons in, uh, in uh, given in the mandate. It is refers to a Jewish national home in Palestine. That presupposes that there are also other people living in Palestine. And that was clear right from the beginning. Initially, the, the um, territory of the mandate expanded from, extended from the, the border of the, the, the Mediterranean to the eastern border of 
present day Jordan. So also on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And uh, the mandate included a provision that made it possible for the mandatory to uh, postpone or withhold the application of provisions of the mandate east of the Jordan. And the British government uh, applied this provision with the approval of the Council of the League of Nations. And that because they had in mind to create there on the Eastern side, an Arab Emirate, which eventually became the kingdom of first Transjordan, now the kingdom of Jordan. So that was provided for. So more than half of the original mandate territory was no longer available for the creation of the Jewish national home, only the part west of the Jordan River. So in the broader area of Palestine, indeed, it was a Jewish national home in Palestine, rather than the whole of Palestine as a Jewish national home. Well, the history of, is, of, of, the, of the mandate is, 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 is not so very uh, impressive. The, the, we see in history a uh, retreat by the British from their obligations under the mandate leading up to the, the White Paper of 1939, which uh, in fact uh, made it impossible for the creation of eventually a Jewish state and made restricted the immigration to a great extent in the days that it was would be so very important to have a safe haven for the Jews, which were subject to persecution in the German uh, Third Reich, as we all know. But um, then the Second World War, and we know everything, what happened then, the Shoah, and um, we will see what happened after that. But first, I will make a, a remark on the legal relevance of the mandate before we leave this issue. Um, the mandate is still relevant in legal terms. And therefore, we have to look at Article 80 of the UN Charter. Article 80 of the UN Charter is a transitional provision from the mandate system under the League of Nations to the trusteeship system under the United Nations Charter. And it provides that um, in Article 80 that uh, until trusteeship agreements were created in respect of former mandate territories like the Palestine, the rights of the states and peoples, and peoples, I underline, under the mandate system should be respected. That means that the rights of the Jewish people under the mandate should be respected, also, and also under the new UN regime. There has never been created a trusteeship in respect of Palestine. So still the rights under the mandate are relevant. And they are especially relevant, of course, when it comes to controversial issues like the settlement of Jews in, 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 the, in the, what they now call the West Bank, uh, Gaza, etc. cetera. And uh, that is the, an important provision. It, has, it is sometimes called the Palestine Clause because it was created because mainly because of the rights under the Palestine mandate, the rights of the Jewish people. Okay, the, then we move on to the, to the uh, territorial issues. What was the territory of the mandate? I said already initially from the Mediterranean to the Eastern border of Jordan. Later on, the part for the Jewish national home was restricted to the part west of the Jordan River. And um, well, after the Second World War, the British want to get rid of the mandate. They wanted to leave and they asked the United Nations to give them their an advice on what to do after that. That resulted in the partition plan. You are familiar with that, I understood. Uh, that was adopted by the General Assembly in 1947. Partition plan, meaning that the, the, the part of the uh, of the, the mandate territory would be subdivided in a, in a Jewish state and an Arab state, 
a very small part of the of the original mandate territory for the Jewish state and another part for the Arab state. That was adopted reluctantly, but nevertheless by the representatives of the Jewish community. They were facing enormous problems, people coming, survivors coming from the camps and had nowhere to go. So they should have a safe haven. So they accepted the, the uh, uh, partition plan, but the Arabs, both in the territory of Palestine and the Arab states surrounding them rejected it forthwith. So the partition plan came to nothing. Uh, then we have the War of Independence, Israeli War of Independence, 1948, 1949, because Israel it was uh, declared its independence on the 14th of May, 1948. And immediately five Arab states uh, started a war against Israel with the uh, purpose to, to, to bring a Jewish state there to an end, to, to erase it from the map. That was not, uh, thank God, not uh, successful, but that resulted in a situation in 1949 when Israel concluded uh, armistice treat, uh, treaties with uh, Lebanon, with uh, uh, Jordan, with uh, Egypt, with Syria, uh, leading to uh, borders or no armistice lines, uh, and uh, which resulted in a part controlled by Israel, which was a bit larger than the partition plan, but smaller than the original, original mandate territory and a situation which lasted until 1967. Then we had a six day war when Israel brought under its control uh, what was called the uh, West Bank because the West Bank was occupied by Jordan in 1948. And uh, it was annexed by Jordan in 1940, uh, 1950. And, uh, but it came under Israeli control uh, the biblical names are Judea, Samaria, in 1967. And also they uh, succeeded in un unifying uh, the city of Jerusalem in 1967, because Jerusalem had been divided as from 1948 by the Jordanians, the, the, the eastern part controlled by the Jordanians. They, they uh, demolished the synagogues and they expelled all the Jews and uh, Israel controlling the west part of uh, Jerusalem. But it was united in 1967. And um, it was as from that, uh, that moment also seen as part of the state of Israel. Israel, uh, ex yes, it was the word of annexation was not used. Uh, some people say, well, you do not have to annex what is already yours, but they uh, extended the, the application of Israeli law to the whole of Jerusalem in 1967, and they adopted in 1980 the basic law on Israel as the capital of Israel. May so I ask Jerusalem about as the, the Golan Heights? Yes, the Golan Heights, that we is have... another issue that was yeah. also controlled, brought under Israeli control in 1967, and it was a special case because it was not part of the original mandate territory. It was it has been the intention to bring it under the Palestine mandate, but eventually it became part of the Syrian uh, Syria mandate controlled by the French. And after that, it, Syria became an independent state and they used uh, the Golan Heights then belonging to Syria as a launching, uh, to launch rockets into the Israel, uh, Israeli territory in Galilee and so on. But in 1967, it became a, it came part of uh, under Israeli control. Uh, it remained under Israeli control in 1973. That is the, the uh, Yom Kippur War. And um, it is uh, in 1981, Israel adopted legislation to extend uh, Israeli law to the Golan Heights. Again, it did not use the word annexation, but it is seen as part of the state of Israel. Uh, that is controversial 
uh, because it is, it is not part of the ori original mandate. But on the other hand, there are some reasons to, to say, well, they have, have a, a legal basis, a good legal basis. Two arguments are brought forward in that respect. Uh, first, in 1967, uh, it was occupied by Israel in a defensive war, not a war of aggression, the aggression came from Syria, but it was a defensive war of Israel. And it was in, in 1967, there were, it was arguable that territory occupied in a defensive war could become your own territory. You could get a title to that territory. That was, is nowadays more difficult to defend, but in, if you have to look at the law as it stood in 1967 to see what the legal situation is. So that's one argument. And second argument is that uh, Israel acted from the principle of necessity in, in exceptional cases of necessity, when your existence is threatened, you may, uh, uh, so, so to say, violate uh, rules of international law that are otherwise uh, would, would make you liable to a violation. But it is, if you can invoke, it is a kind of defense of necessity for this, this uh, occupation of the Golan. So that is an argument that is also relevant uh, if having regard to the way the Golan Heights uh, were used in those days by Syria as a launching ground for, uh, for rockets and, 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 and devices into the state of Israel. And if we look at, at it at a situation nowadays, it would not be a very good idea to bring the Golan Heights under the control of Assad Syria or uh, one of his militias. Uh, and it is better, I think, for the population there Jews, both and, and Jews, people living there, to stay, to remain under the control of the state of Israel. So that was on Golan. Uh, that was one of the issues I, I have now uh, discussed. Well, West Bank, as you know, was is under Israeli control. It's not annexed by Israel. It is not, they did not make a sovereignty, so, sovereignty claim to it. Uh, they could have made so, I think, in the light of the mandate, but did not do so. But it is part of the negotiations with the uh, uh, Palestinians in the framework of the Oslo agreements. The same is true for the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is also a special case because Israel left the Gaza Strip in 2005. Its civilians and its military were withdrawn in those days, very controversial in Israel, but they did so. But it did not lead to peace, but to uh, more attacks from the Gaza Strip into Israel, as we know of the, sub uh, of the subsequent uh, Gaza wars we have seen. And in fact, Israel does not control Gaza, it is controlled by Hamas. Israel does not interfere in the internal affairs, but also only controls the borders and the airspace and the, of course the sea border also. So it is not a, a traditional case of occupation in international law. Can um, I ask in the meantime, uh, yes. Mr. Leblois, uh, yes, I has a question. What is the relevance of the recognition of the Golan Heights as part of Israel, but the US government in 2019 for international law? Well, it's interesting uh, for international law because it was in the declaration by President Trump in 2019 that especially they stressed the point of necessity that there is an existential threat to the state of Israel from the Golan Heights. And that gives it the right to, to keep it under its control and to keep it as a sovereign part of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that is another argument. I mentioned the other argument saying the law in 1967 was arguably different, then you could defend a conquest in a defensive war could be justified. There are many examples in the history, also after the adoption of the 
uh, United Nations Charter, think of what happened after the Second World War, when great parts of Germany became under the sovereignty of uh, Poland or uh, the Soviet Union. And that was accepted in international law. Uh, it was, uh, there are other examples of acceptance, uh, parts occupied by North uh, Vietnam, parts of South Vietnam that was accepted, even if it, it was a conquest um, in an aggressive war. Uh, so uh, in a defensive war, you could, can easily defend that there is a, a good, uh, there are many things, good arguments for Israel to say we have the right to be there. But the, the argument from necessity, it's also interesting, that was used by the Americans and well, it was not accepted by many in the world, but I have not heard some news from Washington that they will do something about it uh, nowadays under the new American president, but we will see. But that was about Jess's questions, I think. The question, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I refer to the Oslo Agreement briefly. Um, that is also has a territorial aspects. Of course, that is Israel and the Palestinian um, the PLO, I have to say, uh, entered into negotiations and it resulted in the Oslo agreements uh, leading to um, a situation where uh, their Palestinian authority controls parts of the uh, uh, West Bank and Gaza. Uh, we have three types of areas. Uh, well, there's our details, but there is an area A where full control, civil control, uh, but also uh, security control is in the hands of uh, the Palestinian Authority. We have area B where civil control is by the PA, Palestinian Authority, but the security control combined by the PA and Israel and the area C where Israel has a full control in uh, all respects, security and the civil control. Um, these negotiations, well, they are not uh, very uh, active negotiating now, we can say. Uh, still, the framework is there and it is provided for in the uh, Declaration of Principles and uh, that, uh, and also in other agreements that there are some issues left for a final agreement to be decided, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees, uh, security, borders, etc. These things are to be decided. So if people say settlements are uh, illegal because of the Oslo agreements, that is not true. They are uh, recognized in the Oslo agreements. They are a subject of negotiations. And it is also stated that Israel has the right and the duty to uh, provide for their safety. Uh, the same about the position of Jerusalem. Uh, it is subject to negotiations. And um, it is also, I think, important to remark that it is not provided for in the Oslo agreements per se that uh, it will result in a Palestinian state. There has been many resolutions since the Oslo agreement mm -hmm. uh, in the United uh, Nations General Assembly. Mm -hmm. But as you said, uh, they're not binding international law. They're just... Uh, an opinion, expression of an opinion. What is the last bit of international law that's applicable to uh, the West Bank or Judea and Samaria in biblical terms? Well, uh, I have to say it is very controversial in international. My position is that I think there are very good claims under international law having regard to the mandate in Article 80 of the UN Charter that Israel has sovereignty, can claim sovereignty over Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, in fact. But um, it has never taken that step. They only extended its sovereignty to Jerusalem, the whole area of Jerusalem. Um, yes, so that is, but that is a very controversial position. Um, it is um, at least in my view, the territories are not ordinary occupied territories. 
also not under international humanitarian law. Israel did not occupy the territory of another state in 1967. It occupied, if you use that word, part, parts of the mandate territory that were originally occupied by Jordan in 1948 and by Egypt, the Gaza Strip. So um, it, was, it is not ordinary occupied territory. I, you can use the term disputed territory. With, when I, in, and I say there is a good claim of Israel, but other people will say, well, we have other views, but it is the general view within the United Nations, also of the Dutch government, uh, is that it is occupied territory. And um, that all the laws in respect of those territories are applicable. Well, Israel itself does apply the humanitarian provisions of the Geneva, Fourth Geneva Convention, for example, but uh, not because it is, feels obliged to do so, but because to have, it wants to have a very valid, a good standard for the humanitarian uh, regime in these uh, areas, for the military commanders. So, um, but yes, it is a very, not a very straightforward answer, but maybe you, you know, have heard my position. And it is very controversial. And um, at least I want to say there are very good arguments. And that is, well, there are very few within the United Nations that accept that, unfortunately. Look at the voting. Uh, uh, the, the yes, and no, and abstention votes in uh, the UN. Okay, um, we were talking about borders, but we have to move on to human rights issues. That's what I promised. And um, human rights, well, human rights, Israel itself respects human rights in the national law. We have to distinguish between national law and international law. In Israeli national law, uh, the human rights are uh, respected in general. Uh, Israel does not have a written constitution, like the United Kingdom and New Zealand, they have no written constitution, as we have in the Netherlands, the Grondwet, but they have uh, a constitution which is composed of unwritten rules and uh, basic laws, as they are called, they are called basic laws, important laws that kind of replace or uh, do the job what in other countries uh, constitutions do, written constitutions do, and we have basic laws on uh, specific human rights. And what is very important in Israel is that we have a very active Supreme Court and its case law, its jurisprudence, uh, uh, serves as a source of the protection of human rights within Israel. Um, Israel is also part to uh, state party to many international treaties in the field of uh, human rights, like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, the uh, Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention Against Torture, Convention Against Discrimination of Women, uh, etc., the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Israel as a state party to it. And um, but also in the international uh, world, and especially in the UN, we have uh, also general supervisory uh, mechanisms in the field of uh, human rights, where we have specific mechanisms of supervision within these specific treaties. But we also have general uh, supervisory framework within the United Nations Human Rights Council. That's a special uh, institution, Human Rights Council, it's composed of 47 member states of the UN, and it's frequently and always dealing with the state of Israel, Israel and the situation in the uh, occupied territories is a uh, fixed uh, agenda item. It's always on the agenda. Uh, and there's no other state in the world, uh, North Korea or uh, China or Saudi Arabia is not, is not, uh, does not have such a agenda item, but it has, Israel has. And um, it's, the, the great majority of its resolutions are on Israel. Uh, and recently, 
Human Rights Council in last year in May, it established a, an international commission of inquiry to investigate violations on the occupied uh, Palestinian territory, including in Jerusalem and in Israel. And that's a commission of inquiry, which has a permanent character. And it is uh, as a very wide mandate to look into, and I quote from, uh, from the resolution, to uh, alleged violations of international humanitarian law and all alleged violations and abuses of international human rights law leading up to and since the 13th of April, 2021, and all underlying root causes of recurrent tensions, instability, protraction of conflict, including systematic discrimination and repressed repression based on national ethnic, racial, or, or religious identity. A very wide mandate, and it is a ongoing invest, uh, commission, independent international commission of in inquiry. But if you look at the composition of the uh, uh, commission, three persons, we can have doubts about the independence. They have a very long record, these three members uh, of uh, of an anti-Israel bias in their previous positions, in their publications, etc. So it is not, I think, a commission we can look upon with much trust, uh, and especially the State of Israel will not do so. They have already, I think, decided not to cooperate. But this commission is also provided for with an enormous budget. Uh, as compared to other commissions, and um, it has been called, qualified as the most hostile anti-Israel inquisition in UN history. And of course, I think uh, the word inquisition has not been chosen by chance. Um, so um, we will look what will happen. They are working but, uh, on that, uh, that is, that is not very positive and not very positive for a balanced approach of Israel within the human rights field because uh, no state is perfect. But if you look at the way Israel is, uh, is approached within UN, especially within the UN Human Rights Council, we see that uh, it, is, uh, it is not a balanced approach, but it is, uh, it is exceptionally critical of Israel and overlooking abuses and human rights abuses in, in, in states like uh, North Korea or uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, China, think of Tibet and so on and so forth. Uh, but as the way the position of Israel is within the UN. This brings me also to the apartheid uh, allegation of, of Amnesty International this year, 1st of January, adopted a report um, that, um, that accuses Israel of, uh, of apartheid. And of course, that is a very, very uh, low term in, in, in international law. You know, apartheid refers to the system of uh, racial discrimination in South Africa based on racial superiority of whites over people of color and which led to a system in, the, in, 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 in South Africa uh, of unequal rights and of uh, discrimination and, and so on and so forth. And this led to an enormous international uh, reaction within the UN and an international response leading to binding economic sanctions against uh, South Africa. Uh, in the field of, of uh, military equipment, equipment, but also in, in general economic uh, boycotts, etc., uh, uh, by the United, on behalf of the United Nations, and in binding decisions by the United Nations. So that is apartheid, and there is also an international convention against apartheid. Uh, Amnesty now uses this this apartheid claim, which is not new, which has been. Years ago, there was a South African professor of law who was a special rapporteur 
uh, dealing with the Palestinian territories, already accusing uh, uh, Israel of uh, apartheid. But now Amnesty has brought it forward in this report. But I, um, I think it is not correct uh, to qualify uh, the state of Israel as an apartheid uh, state. There is no idea of racial superiority behind it. The ideology is missing there. Uh, if you walk around in Israel, you see people of all kind of races and colors, uh, uh, Jewish people, Arab people, uh, and so on and so forth. And there is no, uh, in that sense, apartheid. Israeli citizens, whether they are Jews or Arabs or Druze or other, have equal rights. They can be uh, vote and be elected. You see in the Knesset, Israeli parliament, uh, both Jews and Arabs, also in the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, members, Arab members, we see in the, the cabinet, we see uh, uh, um, Jews and, uh, and Arabs, uh, even the kingmaker maker of the last, uh, cabinet in Israel was an Arab a Muslim from a Muslim party. So it is, I think it, it is uh, not correct. It's even preposterous to accuse Israel of, of apartheid. Of course, there are, when it comes to the situation in the, in the uh, disputed territories, situation where there's a difference between citizens and non-citizens, which is the case in I would say all countries in the world. Nationality plays a role. If you have no nationality of a state, you have no voting rights, etc. in general. So there are differences. There are also differences in when it comes to the security situation in the, uh, in the uh, territories. Uh, think of uh, roads where people with uh, with an Israeli number plate may drive and other people not. Well, that has to do with security. It just has not to do with ethnicity or with uh, being a Jew or an Arab. So um, I guess it is, pre yes, it is, it is incorrect, incorrect to accuse Israel of apartheid having regard to that, uh, to the situation. Even if there are many things to be done and things to be negotiated about the position of Palestinians and so on and so forth, but it is not apartheid. Uh, it is uh, no. Okay. I think that's that's very clear. Thank you so yes. much. Are we moving on to law of war? Yes, exactly. That is uh, well. We have to say well. Unfortunately, we have to discuss the laws of war. Uh, because of the situation of Israel. Um, first of all, there is law in war. It sounds, uh, well, these concepts look like opposite law and war, but there is law in war. Even in biblical times, there was already law in war. Uh, we think of the work of Hugo Grotius in the past. He developed, he wrote a book of the law of peace and uh, war and peace. Um, and um, when it comes to the laws of war, we have to distinguish two, uh, two, two aspects. First, what they call in Latin the use at bellum, namely the right to enter into war. When is it allowed to use violence as a state to enter into war? Under international law, there are two possible reasons, possible, uh, uh, yes, uh, reasons to enter into war. First, when it is uh, violence, force used, I have to say force used under the supervision and by the authorization of the Security Council. If the Security Council uh, allows you to enter into war, uh, that is, under international law allowed. Think of the 9-11 uh, events. Then the Security Council uh, said that the United States could undertake actions in Afghanistan against the perpetrators of these uh, uh, attacks in, on 9-11, uh, 2001. 
So that is with the approval and the authorization of the Security Council. The second uh, uh, justification of the use of force is the individual or collective self-defense, which is provided for in Article 51 of the UN Charter. There is, they refer to the inherent um, right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations. So that is a, an important right that was already there before the United Nations, of course, but it is still there. A point of debate is always the issue of a preemptive strike. That means if there is an immediate threat, are you allowed to give the first blow, or to give the first strike? That may be relevant in the present situation. Think of the developments in Iran. Would Israel be allowed to, to destroy the uh, nuclear facilities before Iran attacks Israel? Well, there is a doctrine of preemptive strikes that allows for a preemptive strike as self-defense in case of an imminent overwhelming leaving of choice of means and no moment of del deliberation attack. If that is pending, an imminent attack, you may act first. Um, well, that is of course relevant, as I said, in case of the uh, of Iran. But Article 51 was also relevant when it, in the advisory opinion I discussed earlier on the security uh, fence in Israel, because Israel said in the defense of its security uh, fence, um, it is a kind of self-defense. We are faced with uh, suicide attacks. And the only thing to, to protect yourself against suicide attacks is by physical means, because suicide attackers do not, are not impressed by, by threats of punishments or even uh, military actions. They want to die. So that is, that is not, so how do we protect our citizens against suicide attacks? Well, by building a physical structure of a wall or a fence or whatever. And that was very successful. Israel said, well, this is an application of Article 51 self-defense. That surprisingly, the International Court of Justice, at least the majority of it, interpreted this right to self-defense in a very narrow way. They said they can only invoke it in case a state is attacked by another state. And these attacks were from terrorist groups, Palestinian terrorist groups, and not by another state per se. Uh, but that is not at all in Article 51 of the UN Charter. It does not refer to an attack by another state. And even the Security Council, as I said in 2001, in case of the 9-11 event, accepted the attacks in, in the US were not by, an, by an, uh, another state, but by terrorists, Al-Qaeda, uh, located in another state, but they were not by the state of Afghanistan, Afghanistan but they were by Al-Qaeda. And in those days, even the Security Council accepted a wider interpretation of Article 51, also attacks by, by non-state actors. And that is historically speaking, also has always been the case when it comes to the right to self-defense. There is a famous case in the, in the 19th century, Caroline case, where it was about the defense in the, in the US against uh, people who uh, uh, wanted to uh, enter the uh, United States and attacked the US from Canada, but they were not the British government, but they were uh, kind of terrorists. So that is a very strange argument of the International Court of Justice, has been criticized also from within the court. Even a judge who was uh, voting for the ruling was very critical. Uh, Rosalind Higgins, Lady Rosalind Higgins, she was uh, uh, very critical and uh, the British judge. But um, nevertheless, that was the position of the International Court. 
But I think Israel has a right to self-defense also against these terrorist groups. So that about the first thing that you said at uh, Bellum, which means uh, the right to enter, to use force, to enter war. Another aspect is what they call in Latin the use in bello. That means what is permissible in war in means in terms of the form, extent, and target of the use of force. What may you use? What kind of force? What kind of military operation you may undertake in, in, uh, in the case of war? And that is the body of the rules we find in the so-called international humanitarian law, the uh, Geneva Conventions, uh, Red Cross Conventions, they are sometimes called. And um, I mentioned two very important principles in that respect. First, there is the principle of distinction. That the basic rule is that, that you have to distinguish in your actions between combatants, say soldiers, and non-combatants, say civilians. You have to make that distinction. And that is particularly uh, difficult in case of the warfare England, Israel is facing, the, the terroristic warfare, uh, because terrorist groups uh, have the, as a kind of tactic uh, of even strategy to hide between and among and behind citizens and civilian objects like schools, like hospitals, like mosques. And um, that's what happened in the subsequent uh, Gaza wars. Uh, Hamas uh, terrorists were hiding and, 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 and creating launching installations in, in civilian uh, buildings or areas. And uh, it, that makes it very difficult for Israel to, to preserve the, the, the principle of distinction. And therefore, we see also many casualties among civilians. They are forced to, to protect the uh, military uh, installations. And um, that is uh, in itself using civilians as a shield is in itself against the laws of war, against humanitarian law. So Hamas could be accused of war crimes in that respect. Um, that is the principle of distinction. Another principle is proportionality. The use of force should be proportional relation in relation to the military objective uh, you want to uh, uh, achieve, what you anticipate. So there has the use of force has to be proportional and not excessive. And that is um, not always simple. And it is uh, sometimes, and also in Israel, sometimes refrains from action because they are afraid there will be too many uh, civilian casualties or so. Uh, it is not just about calculation of the number of victims. Sometimes on television, showing numbers when in, especially in, in the case of the Gaza wars, we saw on television so many people killed on the Israeli side and so many killed on the Palestinian side. And there were many more killed on the Palestinian side. That does not mean per se that that is uh, not proportional because then uh, we have the same principle in national law, by the way, uh, self-defense. If you have to defend yourself in an LA, you are threatened by a person who wants to take your life. If you kill him first, then um, that, that can be justified as under, under the law as self-defense, also in national law. But it does not mean it has been uh, disproportional because the other one died and you are still alive. So it's one to, to zero. Uh, so, well, that also counts, is, is relevant for the, for, for, the, for the warfare Israel is facing. This, but uh, because of the sheer quantity, you just have two numbers. You can say, hey, this is disproportional although that might be a mistake in thinking, 
Yeah. That I, I guess that is mistaken as such yeah. because you have to compare the the objective, military objective, and the uh, and 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 the means you use. And we then, have uh, approximately seven minutes. Is it can 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 I allow some people to ask their questions or oh, do yes, you want to yes. finish it up first, uh, Mr. You're Lewis? welcome. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I can stop here. I had some other things, but I think we having regard to the time, it's maybe good to to stop here. I had something about the ICC, but uh, I, I stop here and then I am. Uh... ICC is a whole different webinar, don't you think? <laughs> uh, yes. I want to ask Albert Klaas to ask his question in the Q&A and also want to um, ask Albert R. Harmsel, uh, like last week, to ask some good questions. I know you can. Uh, first, first question is uh, about your introduction. Uh, it, uh, Hannah Luden uh, is WhatsApping me actually, and yes. she's asking. Um, I know her. How how objective is international law? And if I can rephrase her a little bit, um, where is the space for interpretation, and and who who is to make that interpretation? Yes, a very good question brings us to the heart of international law. It is indeed subject to interpretation. And uh, because many parts of international law use wide principles, I quoted from the self-defense uh, and other examples. So there's a lot of room for uh, interpretation. And in principle, there is interpretation by the states that have to act according to international law. First of all, there is interpretation within, as, uh, as we see within the United Nations, there is interpretation within courts, but even courts, uh, they have all different views. I refer to the International Court of Justice. It is a custom there that judges may include their personal opinions and attach them to the judgment. In many cases, if not all cases, they do so. And we see a whole variety of views about the interpretation of international law. So there's much room. And yes, what if you mean by objectivity that there's only one answer gi given, uh, it is a struggle for the right answer, I guess. A debate, an ongoing debate for the right answer uh, which I think is familiar to the Jewish tradition also, <laughs> an, an ongoing debate on the right answer and the right interpretation, but using arguments, the, framing your arguments within, well, say the norms of a treaty or customary law. That's a kind of common language, but that then you have to interpret. And that's where the, the differences appear. And they cannot be solved in a way by saying, well, this is one Pope who decides what is the right answer. I hope that Hannah is a bit satisfied by this answer. <laughs> Maybe sure we can continue it, the discussion later on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Albert R. Harmsel is asking three in one question, okay, uh, yeah. three questions in one. Uh, Maybe your arguments on Israel are legally right, but isn't it better for Israel and definitely more fair to the Palestinians to give in to the demands by Palestinian people? For example, in building permits in Area C, for example, more freedom to travel, for example, to have their own state, which was part of the petition plan, uh, the Jews in Palestine accepted. Well, of course, there are negotiations. There is a framework of international law. There is no rule, I think, in international law that imposes the outcome of either a Palestinian state or no Palestinian state, some other type of autonomy. Even if I think in the present, personally, I think it is very difficult for Israel to accept the Palestinian state having regard to historic experience, also with Gaza, et cetera. But I think indeed, yes, you can, of course, within the framework of this security cooperation, if it's in the framework of Oslo, it is possible, it has been possible to come to some sort of 
practical solution for practical problems of people working in Israel for permits, for travel, for, yes. The issue of statehood, um, I think in the present situation is very difficult. Um, and uh, of course, Palestine claims it is a state. It is not a state in international law terms. But um, I think when you come to an, if you want to find a solution, it needs two parties. And you also have to satisfy from a Palestinian side, the other party that they can, well, that can lead to a safe solution. We think of Gaza, it was decided by the Israeli government under enormous opposition within its own uh, parliament, also in the Knesset, to leave Gaza, to, to withdraw the troops, but also the civilians there, to, to, to bring down the settlements. Uh, and that did not lead to any form of peace or uh, security. On the other hand, it became a huge launching ground for, for attacks on civilians in Israel. But if that the picture, then I can imagine that there is, and also having regard to the leadership, Palestinian leadership, is there a leadership that can be trusted? Uh, it is very complex. And uh, in Israel, they know, will know it much better than I can say here from my position, but I think it is very difficult. But if there are practical solutions, yes. Uh, yes, there also in Israel, people are open to that. And also the present government, I think. But um, it is very, very complex. We think we have been some years ago in Israel, but also in, uh, they were received in Ramallah by the PLO where they gave a presentation on their position. It was possible for our group to be there. And uh, so hopefully there are, there will be new leadership that, that will uh, give trust to the, uh, make it possible for the Israeli to trust a cooperation in the future. We'll end on that hopeful note. Thank you so much for your questions and a special thanks, of course, uh, to our guest of today, our expert of today. Um, I want to uh, tell again the organization where you work for. You used to work for the Utrecht University, the biggest university of the Netherlands. And now you are a senior fellow at the De Hague Initiative for International Cooperation, Think with a C. Um, this video is on demand available. You can share it uh, via our YouTube channel, CDTV. Um, next week, it fits actually pretty nicely into the topic we dug in today. We are mm. hearing about Jakobovic. It will, uh, the webinar will be about the security concerns regarding the two Palestinian mm. territories. Uh, and in the Very meantime, good. make sure to listen to our Dutch podcast, Mies Rach. Uh, so till next week it's on wednesday 10 o'clock and thank you so much for your questions and your attendance thank you very much have a nice purim <laughs> <laughs>